Hi, everyone. Um, hello, OCO, Brent Abado, Oklahoma Tegega. Hello, I'm Brent, I'm from Oklahoma. Welcome to Culture as a Protective Factor. We are so excited to have you all join us today for this session um, during our conference. Um, and, but before we begin, we want to share just a few instructions about how you can interact during the session. Amy? Great, thank you, Brent. Um, hi, my name is Amy Zukowski. I am going to be the room monitor for this exciting presentation. Um, just a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the um, chat box. I will go ahead and monitor these for Q&A and we'll have our Q&A session after both presentations. Um, during the Q&A session, if you would like to ask a live question, please feel free to raise your hand uh, through the Zoom at, located at the bottom. Um, and then I will go ahead, um, right before our presenters start, I will go ahead and drop a survey link into the chat box. Please take the time to fill out the survey. We would love to hear um, what your thoughts are um, about this wonderful session that we're about to have. Um, and finally, as a quick reminder, all sessions are being recorded on demand for viewing via the website the conference website until April 25th. Please visit the live agenda page if you would like to view the recordings after the conference. Thank you so much and I'll turn it back over to Brent. Thank you so much. I will be your facilitator and I just wanna quickly introduce our two presenters who have graciously agreed to join us today. We have um, Dr. Heather Shunak, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Heather Jean Gordon, who is a research scientist at Child Trends from Alaska. She's a Nupiak, an enrolled tribal member of the Nome Eskimo community, which is a federally recognized tribe. Heather holds a PhD in indigenous studies with a concentration in indigenous sustainability. And Pualani Lincoln Mayalua is from Waimea, Hawaii and fell in love with the ocean and sky as a child. She was first introduced to voyaging through Nakayabaha as a student in high school in 1999. And in 2019, she navigated the Makiliki to uh, Mukumamana. So, so sorry, my Hawaiian is very terrible, uh, but I'm sure that she will tell you how to pronounce everything correctly. And as a mother and educator, Pulani shares her passion for cultural revitalization, traditional lifestyle, and thriving communities. So I will turn it over to Heather to begin the workshop. Thank you all. Okay. We and we can go. see your screen, Heather. Thanks. Okay, can you see, you can just see the one, the, pr the correct view, right? Not the presenting view. Perfect, it looks great on our end. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Brent, so much. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, so my name is Heather Soek, Jean Gordon. I'm gonna be presenting today on some work that I did. I was an a a employee. I just left a a this January, actually. So I did some work while there and I really looked at how our projects, how a a was funding culture as a protective factor um, to address uh, issues of colonization and historical trauma in, in the native communities that we were funding. I wanna just start opening the session with a land acknowledgement. Um, I know that we're calling in from so many different places. So I wanted to give you the opportunity if, if you have not yet looked up on whose lands you're living, um, that there is a website you can go to. You can also text your city or state um, to this phone number. Um, I'm actually presenting today, the picture behind me is a summer view of Homer, Alaska. I'm in Homer today, uh, but it looks a little different in the winter. Um, I'm on the tradition, well, I'm on the lands, excuse me, of the Ninilchik village tribe. Um, I honor their traditions, their elders, their living culture, uh, and I give respect to them who have stewarded the land um, for generations and generations. I also want to recognize um, on all the lands that we are on that um, these lands have been colonized, that Indigenous people have gone through genocide, 
and that they're still living and we are still living under colonization and historical trauma uh, today. So I wanna reflect and as we think about uh, whose lands you're on, it's also important to think about the resilience of the indigenous people uh, through this colonization and ongoing uh, difficulties that many of our communities face, which I'm actually going to be discussing some of the things that ANA funds projects to address. Um, so this land acknowledgement I wanna recognize is only a first step. This is an acknowledgement from one indigenous pe person to the uh, indigenous peoples on whose lands I'm on but it really is only a beginning in regards to what decolonization and the land back movement and what's so important um, uh, to uh, indigenous sovereignty and self-determination having control of their own lands. Going to introduce myself very briefly in Inupiaq, so Pagogivsi, Atiga, Heather, Soyak, Jean Gordon, Inupiaq, Siniga, Soyak, Homer, me, Akaga, Sue, Elizabeth Gordon, Apaga, William, Louis Strutz. Um, so welcome. Uh, my name is Heather Soyak Jean Gordon. My Inupiaq name is Soyak, which means drum. Uh, I'm from Homer, Alaska, like I said. My mom is Sue Elizabeth Gordon, and my dad is William Lewis Strutz, and I'm Inupiaq on my father's side. And I'm actually going to introduce his family on the next slide because uh, they are really the reasons of why I do the work I do. Uh, I was raised in Homer, Alaska here on my grandmother's reindeer ranch, um, learning the Inupiaq, Ilitkusiak, the Inupiaq values. Um, I'm enrolled in the Nome Eskimo community, like Brent said, and uh, my PhD is in indigenous studies. I'm a research scientist too in the youth development program at Child Trends, and I'm always looking for new research partners. Um, so keep me in your thoughts if you're interested in working with me. Um, I do work around Indigenous knowledge, really centering Indigenous knowledge as a basis for any, any topic that I explore. Um, and I've done previous work around self-determination and sustainability, um, culture as a protective factor, uh, restorative justice. And we're going to talk today about culture as a protective factor. And we're going to talk a little bit about colonization and historical trauma. First, um, I wanted to explain why I do the work I do. Why did I do my PhD in Indigenous Studies? You know, why did I work at the Administration for Native Americans? Why am I now working at Child Trends doing tribal and Indigenous community research? It's all grounded in the way I was raised. Um, on my grandma's reindeer ranch, you see on the right-hand side there, uh, that's my grandma, Mary Jean Kaguna Yeni, and her mother is in the middle, uh, Margaret Cecilia Becker Yeni. And then her mother is on the far left, Elizabeth Kaguna Becker. Um, and I'm from originally uh, Nome, which is if you look at that picture of Alaska in the bottom left there, if Alaska had a nose, that's the Seward Peninsula and Nome is on the tip of the Seward Peninsula. So my family members um, faced uh, the great death, the influenza epidemic, um, forced boarding school of my great grandmother. And then my grandmother faced the Jim Crow racism. Um, and all of them face the lack of educational opportunities available to uh, Native people in Alaska um, based on um, different laws and, and ways that things were being run. I want to acknowledge that today I'm going to talk about some data collected from um, surveys. And these surveys are done by the Program Evaluation and Planning Group at uh, Division at ANA. Uh, where I previously worked. Uh, that division is under Amy Zukowski, and uh, the current team is Christy Seinold, Brent Huggins, Maximine, and Samantha Arthur. And that's who I was working with up until the end of 2021. So this presentation is based off of data gathered by 17 different um, pet people through 2015 to 2021. And then this presentation is also based off of a peer-reviewed co-authored manuscript with uh, the supervisor from that division, Amy Zukowski. Um, and we, we wrote a project that, we wrote a paper that writes up all of this, um, looking at um, how, how ANA projects address colonization um, through using culture as a protective factor. And that's what I'm gonna present on today. So um, the, the way the project got started is um, PEP evaluators were noticing the use of culture as a protective factor uh, to address colonization in the projects. And I'll explain a little more from that in a second. But the questions that we asked is what, um, current, what current community conditions are being addressed? And these current community conditions 
are resulting from colonization um, and then the resulting historical trauma. And then we have these adverse current community conditions. So conditions such as food insecurity, poverty, low educational achievement. So these are the types of um, when ANA applicants apply, they apply with the current community condition that they plan to address through their grant. So these are the types of things that they might address. Um, then we wanted to look at what types of culture as a protective factor are being used. And then do projects using culture as a protective factor actually score higher in um, evaluation um, evaluations on the project? And you will find actually that yes, they do. Um, and I will explain that to come. So the data sources for this paper and for this presentation, it, it's drawn from our largest, from ANA's largest um, grant portfolio, which is the Social and Economic Development Strategies portfolio. That funds 65% of yearly projects, and it includes multiple grants in the portfolio. It, it includes the Social Economic Development Strategies grant. It includes that grant specifically for Alaska Native village governments. It included the Native Asset Building Initiative that ran from 2011 to 2015, um, which was products around financial literacy. It includes sustainable employment and economic development strategies, the SEEDS grants, which were around job growth and business development. And then the Native Youth Initiative for Leadership Empowerment and Development, which was from 2016 to 2018. And these were um, grants really looking at youth capacity building, intergenerational work, um, and they had a lot of uh, culture involved. And then the final project that was just funded from 2020 and 2021 was the social economic development strategies for growing organizations. So all of these are included in the data set. Um, and we're specifically looking at those that were funded from 2015 to 2020. So um, we looked at the project summaries, which is kind of like a one page abstract about each project. And we looked at the current community condition, which I was describing on the previous slide, that, that issue that the grant is applying to solve, such as education, loss of culture, poverty, um, these kind of adverse conditions that, that the grant sets out to, to be able to address. And then the other type of data that we looked at was um, at the end of every ANA grant, well, almost every ANA grant, a PEP evaluator, one of the evaluators on the team that I listed earlier visits the grantee and to talk about the, the results of the project and how they did um, in relation to achieving their objectives and their goals, and then how, um, how big of an impact they had on their community. So in along with the very long survey, um, going over all the results of the project, um, the grantee is then given a score on their um, effectiveness, which is achieving how much they achieve their objectives, and on their impact, which is how much impact they had on the community. So uh, this, this study is really mixed methods because we um, I conducted uh, grounded theory coding. So I looked at the current community conditions and from reading those, I developed different categories. And you'll see that on the next slide, all the different current community conditions that ANA grantees were addressing. There was 204 grants in this, um, in this survey. And then um, through looking at the literature, there were about six different types of culture as a protective factor identified. So for each of the grants, I not only looked at what current community conditions they were addressing, but I looked at, are they using culture as a protective factor to address that condition? And if they are, uh, which factor are they using? So for example, um, there could be a project uh, that identified a current community condition of um, uh, substance use in their youth. Um, and this is something they would want to address and they might address it through culture as a protective factor. Um, and so that would be maybe they were teaching the youth to um, uh, either teaching the youth to to carve totem poles. So instead of like directly, you know, oh, there's a substance abuse issue, let's do counseling around substance abuse. Instead, it's a turn to looking at how culture can be protective and by I, learning more about one's culture and identifying with that culture 
and um, engaging in cultural activities, being close to elders, all of these things can be protective factors, which then end up solving that substance abuse issue, even though the substance abuse issue isn't being hit head on, um, but is being addressed kind of through culture. Um, and then there was a quantitative analysis that I conducted of those effectiveness scores, the rate of completion of the objective, and the impacts on the community to see if there was actual significance. If we could say that it was statistically significant, that culture is making a difference um, in these projects being more uh, successful or not. Um, so like I've been saying a lot of times here, I've been talking about colonization and historical trauma, and I just wanna make sure everybody knows um, what I'm talking about. So colonization, involved involved and it continues to involve a variety of things. There was wars, there was genocide, there was slavery of native people, um, the boarding schools, removal policies, uh, land grabbing, assimilation policies, and continued um, laws um, such as uh, the, cer the certificate degree of Indian blood um, that maintain uh, colonization of indigenous people in the United States. When I talk about historical trauma, I'm talking about how that colonization affected people intergenerationally, emotionally, and psychologically, um, and that it it really that it really hurt people and continues to hurt people today. And then when the results of this historical trauma manifest, um, we see these adverse current community conditions. So um, we see. Uh, you know, substance abuse issues, we see suicide rates, uh, we see uh, cultural loss, we see low educational achievement. These are some of the current community conditions that ANA grantees are tying to the colonization and historical trauma in their communities. So this, so I said, when I read all those project summaries of the grants, um, that's when we identified what were the current community conditions that grantees were actually bringing up? What are the results of historical trauma and colonization that they are addressing? So there was 204 projects and 74 projects identified one current community condition they were addressing, while 117 projects identified two or more conditions that they were addressing in their grant. So that could mean a grant either just is addressing poverty or that grant is addressing poverty, um, loss of culture, as well as um, substance use. So grants can be addressing one or more things. Um, so the top, the top things being addressed by ANA grantees from this 2015 to 2020 uh, SEDS grant recipients um, were a lack of employment or business development in the community, a loss of native culture, poverty, low educational achievement or lack of training, weakened ineffective or low capacity government structures. Remember that these are all tied to colonization, uh, mental health disparities, physical health disparities, and then 22 of the grants were going to address high rates of drug and alcohol use. So what, like I told you that I had, I had gone to the literature to, to really explore um, what types of culture are being used as a protective factor. And from that, I got enculturation and identity, traditional activities and games, relationships with the land, social connectedness, native language and spirituality and ceremony. And then when I quote coded the grants of the 204 grants, 101 of those grants uh, did say that they plan to use culture as a protective factor in their project summary. Um, and they discussed uh, one of these factors or more. 51 of the grants were going to just address, use one culture, uh, one type of factor, and 50 of the grants were using two or more types of factors. So I just wanna briefly go over those types of factors. So you have enculturation and identity formation. This is really about learning about the culture and building an identity as an indigenous or a native or tribal person. Um, the, and, and all of these factors are shown to be protective against different things, including substance use and abuse, mental health issues, suicide rates, um, and 
causing reducing school dropout rates, higher academic performance of students, um, increased cultural pride. So there's, um, you know, utilizing these cultures as protective factors. Again, like I said, you don't have to directly address what the problem is, but um, studies have shown that, you know, identity formation or engaging in traditional activities and games such as storytelling, powwows, carving, canoeing, beadwork, basket weaving, these things are protective in our communities. Our, our culture is very, very powerful. And, and this um, connecting with the land, um, learning about subsistence, learning to grow traditional foods. Um, these are things that help um, connect people to their culture before colonization tried to stamp a lot of that culture out, before colonization tried to tell us that our culture was bad and not helpful for us. Um, and our culture really is, our cultures, excuse me, are really powerful um, for us. Social connectedness is another one, looking at family, intergenerational, elder, and community connectedness. Um, this is really tied to well-being, to healing, um, and, and to that bonding and having uh, a sense of support um, in your community. And then native languages is kind of self-explanatory. That's um, uh, teaching through using language in the project. Um, and uh, knowing your native language has been shown to reduce suicidal thoughts and, complete, and completed suicides. And then finally, spirituality and ceremony was the least of the culture factors used, and that's really um, engaging with an understanding of spirituality and engaging in specific ceremonies, whether those be naming ceremonies or sweats or different types of dance um, that, the, that the community or culture does. And these, these have been shown to reduce um, some of the results of historical trauma, such as alcohol use and suicide as well. I want to say I, I talked about these effectiveness and impact ratings. So when the PAP team visits a grant, they're given a rating on a scale of one to four, one being the lowest and four being the highest. Effectiveness is the completion of the objectives. Grantees outline in their grant usually one to three objectives that they plan to address um, that, that will address their current community condition that they've identified. So at the end of the project, PEP evaluators go in and see how much of their objectives they were able to accomplish. So if you get rated a four, you exceeded greater than 100% of the objectives. So you even went beyond what the project had set out to do. Um, a four for impact is a significant positive impact on the community. Um, again, the impact is more of a subjective rating that the evaluator gives. Uh, based off of talking to project staff and also talking to beneficiaries who participated in the project and benefited from the project in the community. So we really, uh, ANA staff really tries to get an overall comprehensive picture of the project. I wanted to share with you that looking at the culture factors, I just wanted to show you the means, so the average scores of projects that use that culture factor. So the social connectedness culture factor, 19 projects use that. And when I averaged out their effectiveness ratings, um, social connectedness had the highest rating of 3.42. So on that scale of one to four, um, averaging out the projects, they had a score of 3.42. So showing that grants that used social connectedness as a protective factor um, were some of the highest likelihood to achieve their objectives. Um, it's actually very great ratings to see uh, pretty much above a three across the board because a three is achieving 92, um, 100 percent of objectives and greater than a three means that they achieved more than 100 percent of the objectives. So seeing these projects that engaged with different culture factors really um, showed that they were able to go above and beyond even what their uh, project objectives had planned. Now we're looking at impact, impact scores, and this is the impact the project had on the community. So you see here that spirituality and ceremony, although one of the uh, much fewer used culture factors, it had a very high impact. Um, projects using uh, spirituality and ceremony had a very high impact on the community with a 3.78 um, average score for projects using that protective factor. 
Uh, social connectedness was second. Uh, you see here that all the scores were above a three, having a positive if impact, if not a significant positive impact on their communities. Um, a quote from uh, Jessica Ulrich, who does work uh, around um, connectedness. She, she says that intergenerational connectedness leads to an awareness that we are never alone in the universe. And, and this is a really big part of how important it is to be socially connected and a, and a part of your community. And it's, it's very much a protective factor for indigenous communities. So I wanna show here, this is the effectiveness rating means by grant type. So these are the average scores. Um, so when you look at this graph, you see the little black numbers on the bars. Those numbers show the number of grants. So if you look at the SEDS category, uh, 28 SEDS grants used culture as a protective factor. Those are the purple ones. And then the light pink ones are the grants without culture as a protective factor. So as you can see, for every, um, for every type of grant except for ILEAD, and I'll explain why in a second, grants that used culture as a protective factor scored higher effectiveness scores than grants not using culture as a protective factor. Um, so it, it was actually causing, it, it's actually shown that grants using culture as a protective factor are achieving their objectives at higher rates than grants not using culture as a protective factor. ILEAD was a, is a unique, um, ILEAD, NABI and SEDS GO were very unique because they only had visits during COVID. And ILEAD was specifically very heavily impacted by COVID um, because built into that funding opportunity announcement was intergenerational and cultural activities, which were not really able to be done in a lot of the communities due to the risk of COVID to the elders and to spreading COVID in the community. So that's um, one of the reasons the effectiveness scores are low for ILEAD grants were because they weren't able to do the activities they had set out and planned. Now, if you look at the impact rating scores, um, you again see that grants with culture as a protective factor scored higher um, than grants without culture as a protective factor. ILEAD again being the one outlier because uh, they again were not able to complete their activities and have the impact on the community that they were hoping for. Um, you'll notice that the SEDS projects, the all types of projects, and then the all types of projects except those grants that only had um, visits during COVID, those grants had the highest numbers of grants. So I was able to, because they had very similar numbers of grants with culture as a protective factor and grants without culture as a protective factor, I was able to run tests of significance on the SEDS grants, the all types of grants, and the all types except those ones affected by COVID. So when I ran a test of significance, the reason that this matters is in, in academic work, being able to say that there's actual significance shown. So it's, it's more than just the average is higher than the other average, but actually going through a significance test um, shows that it's, it's something more than just a better average. It's actually a, a statistically significant. The numbers are actually showing that there's something um, that's that's making this go. It's not it's not just the it's not just showing a mean, but it's actually showing a test that makes it um, that makes it significant at at a level that it, in the academic world uh, makes it have a lot more weight. Um, so just showing means, like I showed you on the previous slide, that that wouldn't have as much weight um, to a to someone as much as now I can say, well, I did the SEDS grant and yes, the means, culture as a protective factor for SEDS, the means was 3.5 and culture not as a protective factor being used was 3.08. So yes, the mean was already ready, but when I did a test of significance, it was actually shown to be significant. So, so that means again, that the, the SEDS grants are achieving the SEDS grants using culture as a protective factor are achieving their objectives significantly more than grants not using culture as a protective factor. Um, and this was also found in all types of grants. Um, once we removed ILEAD and the other grants affected by COVID, 
that that these grants are found to have um, to achieve their um, objectives at at much greater rates just because they're using culture as a protective factor. Uh, so I just want to conclude with saying that our, our cultures are, are really our strengths. And that's that's what this um, presentation and paper is really trying to show. And that it's so important to incorporate culture as a protective factor into funding announcements of all types, not just social funding, but economic funding, uh, language funding, and um, environmental funding, all of that. Um, includes, you know, part of humans as part of the ecology of the world in an indigenous perspective. Um, in relation to ANA, you know, other funders can learn from this that prioritizing culture as a protective factor actually shows that those projects achieve their goals and objectives better than other projects. And that policymakers can acknowledge that economic enhancement of indigenous communities cannot happen without our culture and our governance. Um, so many policy, uh, poverty programs are concerned with economic enhancement, this or jobs or this, but if it's not with our sovereignty and our culture as a part of it, then it's just not going to be as successful. Uh, so I want to thank you very much, Kwanakbuk, and I know we're doing questions at the end, so I am going to stop sharing my screen so that the other presenter can go. All right, thank you so much, Heather. Pulani, would you like to go now? And we can still see your screen, Heather. I am. There we go. Hey, hello, Kako. How is that, Brent? Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Okay, my kai. My ka, my kahi kina kala iha ena ku, ai ke kau kala iha ena moe. My kapiko o mau na awakea i ka pali lele manu o moku mana mana. My ke one pala halaha o satawa i ka pa papa mahano o tautira. Ai kahi uhi u o matata velina mai ki aloha e na kupo o moana nui akea a me na poe o ka honua nui akane. Aloha no kako. Uh, from the rising sun of Haena Ku to the setting of the sun at Haena Moe, from the summit of Mauna Awakea to the cliffs of the soaring birds of Mokumana Mana, from the extended sands of Satawa to the warm coral flats of Tautira and to the chilling ocean of Matata. Aloha and good evening to some of you, good afternoon to others, um, to all the descendants and natives of this great ocean of Moana Nui Akea and to the peoples of the great earth of Kane. My name is Puolani Lincoln Mai Elua and I'm from Pu'ukapu Waimea on Hawaii Island and I'm currently raising my children here in my ancestral homelands of Kauai Komohana. I'm an Aukai Va'a of Makali'i and my ohana along with my husband and children are dedicated to our ancient traditions of canoe voyaging and carving. Okay, ko ikeia. This is the Hawaiian ads, our traditional tool for carving, shaping, sculpting. It is our most sacred tool, therefore our most sacred object. Our story starts here, but in order to tell this story, I must share with you first all another story that interweaves with this one and brings it into the fold of today, as well as our quest as an indigenous people to activate the cultural traditions of our ancestors. Okeia Hokulea, the matriarch of our voyaging canoes, not only here in Hawaii, but throughout all of Moana Nuiakea. Many of you may be familiar with Hokulea as her most recent voyage was a three-year journey around the world. But her story does not begin with the ko'i or a celebration of successful long distance voyages. It actually begins with the colonizers influence over our story of migration and ancient origins. In the 1940s and 50s, 
the ancient migration history of Hawaii and Moana Nui Akea were, were dismissed by two white men, Thor Heyerdahl and Andrew Sharp. These men published their stories of accidental drift and settlement, which in turn created an educational movement around the world, retelling a false narrative of our explorations and successful settlement of the largest body of water on the planet. These accidental theories filled the pages of the history textbooks, some of which are still being taught in schools today. So it was from this platform that Hokulea was envisioned. In 1973, the Polynesian Voyaging Society was established by three men with the sole purpose to disprove these accidental theories of Andrew Sharp and Thor Heyerdahl. These visionaries understood the damage that such theories had caused to generations of islanders of Moana Nui Akea, a damage that is still being dealt with even today. And they were determined to ensure that the correct history would fill the pages of all history books to come. So in order to accomplish this, the founders of PVS crafted the ultimate science experiment, the Hokulea, and it needed to have a specific number of components. The first was an ancient Hawaiian voyaging canoe replica. We had to build the vessel that they felt we were incapable of building. We had to build the vessel that Thor Heyerdahl and Andrew Sharp felt didn't exist. The second was an ancient route, a sail plan, something that uh, was well beyond 300 nautical miles. So they chose the most ancient route for us here in Hawaii, it was actually a two-way trip from Hawaii to Tahiti and back here to Hawaii. One way, 2,500 nautical miles. The third was they needed to establish crew and watermen. And how do you find crew and watermen for an ancient vessel that didn't exist for so many generations prior? Well, they went to the beaches and they went to the fishing boats and they found lifeguards and divers and fishermen and surfers and paddlers and they assembled the most elite group of watermen here in Hawaii at that time. The fourth component was a traditional Polynesian navigator. And I have the quotations around Polynesia because a part of the colonization of our thinking of who we were was also in the mapping of who we were in the, all of the maps that were being produced and charted throughout the world. Instead of recognizing our ocean as one ocean by its many ancestral names, one of them being Moana Nui Akea, cartographers started to split us up into what they believed were like these cultural um, unified areas. Um, Polynesia was one, Micronesia was another, and Melanesia was the third. These are not ancient names. Um, these are spaces that were created to try to identify and understand Moana Nui Akea are these ancient people, but what they ended up doing was they started to create this divide amongst all of us. So here in Hawaii, we're, oh, we're Polynesian, right? This is who we are. But Polynesia is not how our kupuna um, identified ourselves. We identified ourselves as Moana Nui Akea, ocean people. Well, finding a traditional navigator was definitely the most challenging part of this project. And I could do a whole hour on just that part. So I'm gonna just keep it short and sweet. It was the most challenging part, yet it was the most important. Without a navigator, the entire experiment would have crumbled. So after, after uh, many trials, we were finally blessed to find this man, Pius Mao Piailug, who we fondly call Papa Mao from the island of Sarawa a product of generational knowledge, the type of cultural knowledge that contributed directly to the survival of his people, their very existence even today. He never recognized or acknowledged the, these imaginary lines of, of demarcation that divided up the great ocean nation of Moana Nui Akea. And because of that, he could make the leap here to Hawaii and guide us through some of the most in, in, significant decades of our revival, cultural revival here in Hawaii. He was a, a living ancestor, someone that could teach us with his eyes and his hands, the old ways that were not available to us to access at that time so readily. So on May 1st in 1976, Hokulea departed from Honolulu, Maui for Tahiti. 
It had been 600 years since an ancient voyaging canoe using traditional navigation embarked on such a journey. Over 2,500 nautical miles, no GPS, no map, no chart, no compass, no sextant. I'm gonna say that again, no GPS, no map, no chart, no compass, no sextant. A man here, P.S. Malpiailo, guided this canoe. He had never been to Tahiti before. He had never seen Tahiti with his own eyes, but he believed in the knowledge that his kupuna gave him, his ancestors gave him so much that he had the courage to be able to do it. 31 days later, Hokule arrived in Tahiti to thousands of people celebrating the reopening of our ancient sea road and voyaging traditions. But in the 1970s in Hawaii, this is what it looked like. We were battling to protect the island of Koho Olave that was being used as a target practice for the US Navy. We were being forced from our ancient fishing homelands at Mokowea. We were fighting homelessness, the right to practice our own um, cultural traditions of hula, song, gathering rights. We were fighting to be Hawaiian. And in the 1970s, Hokulea embarks on a journey to disprove these accidental theories. And in the, in the aftermath of that, the success of that leads to cultural revival, cultural renaissance, and most importantly, the cultural reawakening of not just Hawaii, not just Moana Nui Akea, but indigenous people throughout the world. This reawakening inspires then the dreams of voyagers and students of Papa Mau in those, in those 1970s, 1980 years. Brothers and natives of Waimea, my, my hometown, Shorty and Clayton Burleman, they dream of building another canoe, a canoe like Hokulea, a voyaging canoe, but a voyaging canoe that would specifically support the needs and the cultural education of the families of Hawaii Island. So first they approach their kupuna, a council of elders with a specific request to build this voyaging canoe. The name Nakalaiva'a is gifted to the initiation of, of our grassroots organization with the responsibility and obligation that if this name was carried by this collective movement and vision, that we would dedicate the birth of our organization to the traditional carving of a wooden canoe prior to the modern construction of a deep sea going vessel. So to the forest we went, to the mountains we sought for the tree. And after months and months of searching, that's another hour long presentation, so I'll fast forward here. After months and months of searching, a tree reveals itself the traditional koi that adds that sacred tool I told you about in the beginning was harvested from the highest summit of our island at Kianaka Koi of Mauna Awakea. And donned in traditional attire and activated by ancient prayer, the Kalaiva'a, these canoe carvers here pictured here, began the work of their ancestors. Our fearless leader, <clears throat> once again, our living ancestor, P.S. Mao P.I. Look, Papa Mao, those same hands and eyes and spirit that guided us to Tahiti in 1976 aboard Hokulea, he then taught us how to hold, sharpen, and carve with our most sacred tool, the koi, the adz. The log was hewed and carved in the sacred space of Honaunao, a Honua, what we refer to as a place of refuge, and the space was heavily protected protected and ignited with intense protocols, ensuring that each step of the process was as closely aligned to the traditions of the Kalaiva'a that they could recall. We call this kapu, um, a set of restrictions that are established to a space or to an act or to a, to a engagement to ensure that um, things are aligned properly. It also creates uh, sacredness within that space under that couple. 
after months of work and thousands upon thousands of hours of ancient chant and prayer, ceremony and ritual under the specific guidance and tutelage of Papa Mao, the canoe was rigged and prepared for her transformation and transition to the ocean. And in 1993, Mauloa made completely of native materials gathered and harvested here on our island of Hawaii, carved and shaped and sculpted with traditional tools was launched in the beautiful waters of Honaunao. Mauloa is the igniter and the initiator for our organization in the building of our voyaging canoe, Makali'i. In 1995, two years later, the ko'is were placed down and the fiberglass um, was engaged and we built the voyaging canoe Makali'i. Uh, she was launched here in Kauai High in 1995 and immediately took off on her, her shakedown voyage and maiden voyage to Tahiti. It was an incredible um, accomplishment uh, for the people of Hawaii Island, but especially for the people of Hawaii to be able to link this voyaging canoe uh, to a traditional uh, carved vessel, Mauloa. But while Makali sailed and educated students on the ocean, Mauloa sat in her hale and educated our students with the story of her origins, the importance of the forest, and, and served as a reminder of the role of ancient protocols, prayer, and chant necessary to recommit our people to the voyaging canoe traditions. But as she rested here on land, so did the koi that sculpted her. And as a sacred tool rested, so did the carver. The Kalaiva'a was now focused on the ocean, sailing the ancient courses of our ancestors and studying the timeless sky of celestial beings and endless ocean of swells and currents. And that leads us to our project. The Maulo Restoration Project honors the traditional practice and authentic learning of Kalaiva'a. This project will bring together the remaining Loya Kalaiva'a, masters of traditional Hawaiian canoe carving and construction to pass their traditional knowledge, skills, and practices to the Haumana A'o'oihana, or what we call the apprentices, by engaging in the complete restoration of the traditional sailing canoe Mauloa. It has been decades since Mauloa has been restored or touched in that way, cared for in that way. And in that time, that koi has also sat and awaited this reactivation. So the restoration of Mauloa really creates a, a platform for all of us to preserve a culture that at one time didn't exist for us here in Hawaii, that was reignited many years ago by Papa Mao, and then kind of went to sleep a little bit, and now we're rebuilding those connections again. So just for you to see kind of Mauloa, this is kind of her current state right now. You can see this is her pe'a. Her pe'a is kind of popopo. It's, it's, it, it needs some reworking. We'll be recreating her sail. We'll be redoing mo majority of her uh, parts to the of the canoe. So all of the different rigging that is used to assemble her, but the hull will remain the same uh, with a little bit of work uh, to make her lighter. Some of our project outcomes here, um, funded by um, Anna, so we're very grateful for this that opportunity, is that we will um, ensure that 12 Kalaiva'a will serve six Native Hawaiian communities here in our Pai'aina and archipelago. 40 Aha and Aha, which is the cordage used to lash the canoe, Lauhala, which is the fiber used to make the sails. 40 of those practitioners will be able to serve their Hawaiian communities as well. And then lastly, we will, we will ensure that six communities here in Hawaii are preserving, practicing, and perpetuating traditional canoe construction and restoration. So a bit of an introduction to you of our Naloea, of all of those who came together to build Mauloa many decades ago, we have six remaining masters or loea that learned directly from uh, P.S. Mao P.I. Lug. And I'd like to honor them by calling out their name today. 
Tava Taapu, Shorty Bertelman, Mo Lily Dixon, Ernie Reyes, Mike Manu, and John Kiolanui. And here in this photo, I have uh, Uncle John Kiolanui with his grandson, Makana. And um, a part of the process that we've been going through because of COVID, as was kind of shared in the earlier presentation, COVID really changed the way that we could execute the grant. But in a lot of ways, it's been a blessing for us to refocus on, on who it is that we need to restore. Where is it that we need to reveal that ancient carver in each family? And Uncle John Kiola Nui has been critical in us understanding that. Here's a picture of him with his grandson. It's the first time his grandson has ever met Mauloa. It's the first time his grandson has ever seen him in this space uh, as a carver. And it was one, probably one of the more beautiful moments that we've experienced over the past couple of years because for Uncle John, he was able to reignite um, this fire within himself by igniting his grandchild in the work knowing that by sharing this these learning moments with him and experiencing and engaging in Maulua once again with him that that koi that sits in his house wrapped up in his pale and hale ensuring that it is safe and ready for the next person to carve will actually go into the hands of his grandson and not into a museum not into some box or into a shelf but will actually be used by him so we have a long list of apprentices, but I want to talk a little bit about what apprenticeship has been looking like here for us at Nakalaiva'a. It's really about re-engaging our ohana again. COVID changed plans significantly for many of our grants. I'm sure we're not the only one, but one of the greatest lessons that we've learned from COVID is that because we had to care for the health and well-being of especially our masters, these elders, these kupuna, of, of this art, there's only six left, right? So taking care of them was our major priority. We really could only engage with their families. So that changed the way that we called people together. And so instead of inviting 50, 60 plus community members who are interested in learning this art, we invited the masters and we asked them to bring their family members. And that's been beautiful. So I wanna share some imagery with you about that process. For over three decades, some of these tools sat in special places within each of these masters hale. This is Papa Shorty, we call him Papa Shorty, Uncle Shorty Bertelman, sharing with us the very tools that were held by Papa Mao in the creation of not just Mao Loa, but also other, um, other parts of our canoes, especially Makali'i that we use today. telling their stories, telling their names, sharing their origins. This time together with Mauloa has reactivated our master carvers, our loea, but also has reactivated in the space of multiple generations of carvers. Here you have Mike Manu using a koi for the first time in almost over 30 years. Um, Uncle John Kiolanui learning how to relash another style of koi with um, a young boy who's 15 years old, who is actually teaching him how to do it. We have a saying here in Hawaii, makahana kaiki, ma makahana kaike, by learning one, by doing one learns, by experiencing one gains knowledge. So here, what has been beautiful is that the space that Maoloa was created in was under very strict kapu, very specific restrictions to ensure that, lear that the process was was uh, in order. But in this space, we've removed a lot of those couple. We've lifted those restrictions so that learning can occur in a space that is not, that, that is a little bit more free, allows for students to learn together, for families to sit together, for women and men to sit together and do it together. What that has done is that's allowed for multiple generations to build strong relationships with the sacred tools that they might have seen hanging on the wall in their grandparents' house or tucked away in a case in the museum. 
Most importantly, our time together has reestablished the hale and the halau kalaiva'a, the space for learning and experiencing and engaging where tools and students and teachers are engaging in a space and interweaving amongst each other, all ignited by the story of Mauloa. One of our workshops focused on crafting and creating these model va'a in the shadows, if you will, of Mauloa here in the back of the photo um, from seven years old, actually, I think the youngest was five years old, from five years old all the way to over 70. We sat encircling Mauloa inspired by those ancient lines carved by Papa Mao, who is no longer with us today and created our own um, little mini versions of her models of her to be able to understand that process that they went through so many years ago. And this is really what it's all about. When our masters come and they engage at Mauloa and they they worry about forgetting what they did, they are inspired by knowing that this generation now of young carvers are gathering to honor Mauloa and ready to learn and ignite that next generation of, of carvers here. And that's been one of the biggest lessons for us here at Nakalai Va'a, is that each of these carvers come from a family and that if each of those families produce one apprentice, one person who will follow in the wake of their grandfather or father or great grandfather, then we've been able to um, rewrite those pages of the book that maybe were not written properly or that were definitely not written properly many years ago. And I end with this Mao uh, Mao means to to be perpetual, to continue on and on and on. Um, it's no coincidence that that's the name of our our grandmaster, our father, P.S. Mao Piailog, then becomes the name of our canoe, Mauloa, which means to forever, to forever continue. And Mauloa, I end with this this idea of sovereignty. Um, of air for us here in Hawaii, in a lot of ways, people recognize it as the canoe. The canoe represents that sovereignty because everything that you need to build that canoe comes from the land. And everything that you need to ensure that that canoe can successfully voyage, it comes from the land. So it's a really important reciprocal relationship. But beyond even just the fact that the land connects back to the canoe, the sovereignty is actually in the ko'i. It's in that ads because the ko'i is what creates this. And the ko'i reminds us our responsibility to pass on that sacred tool to the next generation. So, mahalo nui, aloha no. Thank you so much, both of you, Heather and um, Pulani. We really appreciate it. I know it warmed my heart to hear all of this, and to hear your stories. Thank you so much. We are really running short on time. So um, uh, there was a question in the chat about where to find the paper that Heather uh, referenced. She has submitted it uh, for publication to a journal, but it's still under peer review. Um, but she also dropped her email in the chat. So uh, if you'd like to email her, I'm sure that she would send it to you once it's ready for publication. Um, and uh, I think there, were there any other questions, Amy, that I miss? Yes, um, we did have one quick question um, and maybe Heather can address this um, uh, quickly uh, since we are running out of time. Um, how can enculturation occur without native language if it's available in the community? Yeah, I just tried to write back to that briefly in the chat. Um, yeah, if native language is, is available in the community, then of, of course it's it's very involved in enculturation activities. I mean, you just even heard from our second presenter today who really gave us a fantastic example of how traditional activities and language, you know, you don't just have to be in a native language class. Um, it, it can all happen as once as the indigenous knowledge is being passed on. Um, but I wanted to say, you know, with the boarding school era, there was a lot of language loss and some communities lost um, lost their language completely. Um, and so there there is knowledge, you know, that can be passed down through elders and traditional activities and subsistence and spirituality. 
Um, and there's knowledge, uh, as much as so much knowledge is held in language, there is culture and, and knowledge still available for those communities who did go through language loss. Thank you, Heather, for that. Um, we just want to thank everyone for joining this phone call or this presentation today. And we hope that um, you will join us tomorrow. Um, this uh, presentation will be on the website as a recording where you can also find some of those resources. Email Heather if you want the specific article in the future once it's published. And um, please take the survey. We would really love that. Um, thank you all so much and have a lovely evening or day if you're in Hawaii or other places in the Pacific.